There is a Sherlock Holmes story, Silver Blaze, which hangs on the clue of the dog that didn't bark in the night. Sometimes it's the lack, it's the absence, which tells you all you need to know. Today, it was the strange absence of Conservative MPs on the Commons benches. The opposition benches were packed. But all day, Tory MPs have been heading by any means they could find away from Westminster, by pony trap, hot air balloon, penny farthing and skateboard, off the they went back to their constituencies. Some said they were ill, others that they had urgent business they'd forgotten about. So, why did they flee? Because many of them did not want to back Boris Johnson in a vote over Partygate. His government had put down a motion to delay an embarrassing parliamentary inquiry into law-breaking and whether or not the Prime Minister lied. But late last night, government whips seemed to panic as they realised too many of their own people might not be on side. And so they tore up their own motion and they chucked it in the bin. In parliamentary terms, that means surrendering the ground to Labour. And that means this evening the opposition got its way and the MP's inquiry will go ahead. So what does that all mean and why should you care? Hang around. What this tells us is that the Prime Minister is still on shaky ground with his own MPs. How much does the inquiry itself matter? Well, it'll be able to ask for photographs of parties and details about them that have not yet been shared with the public. At the very least, it's going to string out the story of the illegal parties and lies and cause further embarrassment around the time of the local elections. Liar, by the way, does now seem, as of this afternoon, to be a word allowed in the House of Commons. All in all, perhaps not the most glorious day for Her Majesty's Conservative Party. No rules were broken. We know that because the Prime Minister told the House of Commons. After closing its investigation earlier today, 126 fixed penalty notices for rule-breaking have been handed out to Downing Street staff by the Metropolitan Police. But no rules were broken. Three people were fined, 28 people received up to five fixed penalty notices, and no rules were broken. Boris Johnson has received only one fine for that moment with a birthday cake. That must mean he attended illegal gatherings, but he did so legally. Must have done. No rules were broken. People can huff and puff all they like, but the end of the police investigation means the legal part of this lockdown saga this evening is formally over. I can dimly hear the sound of a greased piglet squealing with relief and cavorting delightedly in the early summer undergrowth. As of today, I can see absolutely no sign of a revived determination among Tory MPs to get rid of their Prime Minister. No hubbub, barely any muttering. In public, at least, a general silence. But the politics of Partygate isn't over. It's a hard, complex thing to get our heads around. If he's really escaped, then book after book is going to be written about what didn't happen today. There will be conferences of historians, all with one theme. How on earth did he do it? The picture shows Boris Johnson with a broad grin, glass in one hand, toasting a cheery room, which is toasting him back. So what? Well, so the picture, released tonight just ahead of Sue Gray's report on the illegal lockdown parties, is of an event in November 2020. In the Commons last December, Boris Johnson was asked whether it was a party, and he said this. No, but I'm sure that uh, and it, whatever happened, uh, the guidance was followed and the rules were followed at all times. Oh, really, Prime Minister? Meanwhile, Keir Starmer, who's facing a police investigation of his own, was at a supermarket in North London campaigning on rising food prices and his favoured solution. Here at Sainsbury's, both staff and customers have been talking about the cost of living, uh, the prices that they can't afford. Part of the answer is staring the Prime Minister in the face, and that's Labour's plan for a windfall tax on oil and gas companies. Lots of things seem to be staring Boris Johnson in the face. I'll be talking about him and parties, but I'm going to be talking a lot more about food and why it costs just so much more. Tonight with Andrew Marr, this is LBC. At Westminster today, the biggest presence is the absence of Sue Gray. Everything else in politics, it seems, must stay until the publication of Sue Gray. Boris Johnson and his enemies both, of course, devoutly pray that on their side will be the verdict of Sue Gray. The state declines, our politics decay, but to save us as a neutral civil servant high above the fray, there will arrive this week Sue Gray. 
The first indications are that despite a mysterious private meeting with Boris Johnson last week, the civil servant Sue Gray's report into those illegal lockdown parties is going to be tough. We think that because ITN has tonight published photographs showing Boris Johnson in um, a bullion mood at what seems to be a boozily uproarious gathering. There may be trouble ahead. Good evening. It's been one heck of a day in the story of Boris Johnson's government, and I'm going to start today's show slightly differently. There is no more formidable weapon in modern life, no greater gift than an open microphone. And with your permission, today I'm just going to use it. Some of you will be in the car wondering when those lights are going to change. Some will have just shuffled down some beans or fish fingers to the kids, and I can see you, you're about to surreptitiously finish what they haven't eaten. Some of you, jogging on this sweaty, sick, sweaty evening, are listening on little earbuds, some are watching on your computers, a beer lined up alongside, but I assume and I hope you're all interested in the Boris Johnson story. So, what tonight do you really need to know? First thing, obviously, you're not going to get a new Prime Minister anytime soon. Now, you might think that's frankly weird, since for weeks and months he's been telling us and the House of Commons no rules were broken in those parties which didn't happen. And now today we have it in black and white. Not just that the rules were broken, but those who broke the rules at the parties knew it at the time. They discussed it. Some at least thought they were taking a lead from the Prime Minister himself. And what followed is laid out in gruesome detail in the Sue Gray report. The wine stains on the walls, the vomit, the boozy rudeness to staff. Frankly, what he'd told us before is nonsense. So how come he's still there? Well, here's the second thing you need to know, his defence. He says he turned up to thank staff who were leaving, he left again and he had no idea about the parties that were going on in his absence. Here he is in the House of Commons. I had no knowledge of those subsequent proceedings because I simply wasn't there. And I have been as surprised and disappointed as anyone else in this House as the revelations have unfolded Surprised and disappointed. Well, that presupposes two things. First, that it's a very well-insulated building. Somehow, he couldn't hear, and he missed all the partying going on around him. And he was genuinely shocked to read about it when Sue Gray dug it out much later. Well, that's just plausible. Number 10 is indeed a very big and rambling place. But it also suggests a strangely incurious Prime Minister. I mean, when all those stories came out, why didn't he just turn to the people around him and ask what had been going on? At a press conference in Downing Street, after he had left the Commons, I asked him just that. It's absolutely blatantly obvious from Sue Gray's report that the staff involved knew they were breaking the rules. They talked about going out by back entrances, avoiding the cameras, and so on. You told us, you told the House of Commons, you told the British people again and again that no rules were broken. When those stories started to come out about the parties, did it never occur to you to ask around and find yeah. out what had happened? Yes, of course, and that's when I instituted the, uh, the inquiry. Um, who's, who's next? Who's next? Not me. But as the inquiry was beginning to grind on, he was still telling everyone, with confidence as Prime Minister, that no rules had been broken. It was nonsense. I say again, why didn't he just ask? This lack of crucial knowledge is very important to the Prime Minister's future, because if you lie to the Commons under our system, you are out. The next thing you need to know, however, is that politics is an animal business. Johnson just wants it more, wants to stay there more than any of his Tory opponents. He's a big, sometimes charismatic, sometimes ferocious beast, the albino gorilla. The rest of them, by comparison, are timid little vegetarian things who constantly run off into the undergrowth when a confrontation seems to be coming. They don't have the glossy lower organs, as it were, to take him on. And today, the big beast had found a new formula, words which sounded as if he'd learned his lessons and was, quite possibly, contrite. I want to begin today by renewing my apology to the House, uh, to the whole country, for the short lunchtime gathering on the 19th of June 2020 in the Cabinet Room, uh, during which I stood at my place at the Cabinet table and for which I received a fixed penalty notice. And I also want to say, Mr Speaker, above all, that I take full responsibility for everything that took place 
on my watch. <laughs> he took full responsibility, by my count, around 12 times during his common statements and then several, several, several times more during the press conference afterwards. But what does taking responsibility mean these days? Is it just a verbal flourish? What follows from it? In the old days, taking personal responsibility was almost a synonym for I am about to resign. Well, I don't know what it means now. Anyway, this extraordinary day had started with an almost festival atmosphere in the coffee bars around Westminster. The kind of slightly hysterical, brittle cheerfulness I imagine you saw on the cobbled streets in the old days before a public hanging. Now, no one actually thought this time the chief culprit would consent to be hanged. We all knew he'd hand back the rope with a smile and a bold admission of personal responsibility. But we felt something would happen, some kind of reckoning after all this time and hoo-ha. And my friends, we were all wrong. The Labour leader stuck to economics in Prime Minister's questions, which meant it turned into a competition about tax policies, the kind of wham-bam verbal electioneering Boris Johnson excels in. After 40 minutes, I have to tell you, for all the opposition rhetoric, nobody had laid a finger on him. But Keir Starmer, who loathes the idea that politicians are all the same and that he is somehow similar to Boris Johnson, sounded properly stern. The door of number 10 Downing Street is one of the great symbols of our democracy. Those who live behind it exercise great power, but they do so knowing their stay is temporary. Long after they've gone, that door and the democracy it represents will remain firm and unyielding. But Britain's constitution is fragile. It relies on members of this House and the custodians of number 10 behaving responsibly, honestly, and in the interests of the British people. When our leaders fall short of these standards, this House has to act. Ouch. Boris Johnson, remember, is supposed to be in full apology form. Humble pie and grovel sauce. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But oops, he seemed to forget all of that as he exploded delightedly at the Labour leader. After months of his, frankly, sanctimonious obsession, uh, Mr Speaker, the great gaseous zeppelin of his pomposity has been permanently punctured uh, and irretrievably by the revelation that he is himself, well, he didn't mention this, he is himself under investigation by the police... Now, as I may have mentioned once or twice before, politics is often more like cage wrestling than sophisticated exchanges of arguments. Quite soon, the Tory benches were making a noise which sounded like Shrek being sick, quite possibly after a leaving party, and which is meant to signify their approval. After about ten minutes of Johnson's explanation, they started to leave the chamber for lunch. Nothing more to see here. A very few were bold enough to stand up to tell him what they really thought of him. One of them, who will join me later on, was Tobias Elwood, chairman of the Defence Select Committee. This is a damning report about the absence of leadership, focus and discipline in number 10. The one place where you expect to find those attributes in abundance. I made my point and my position very clear to the Prime Minister. He does not have my support. But a question I humbly put to my colleagues is are you willing, day in and day out, to defend this behaviour publicly? Can we continue to govern without distraction, given the erosion of the trust with the British people? And can we win the general election on this current trajectory? Good question, Tobias, and he's not alone. Quite a few Tory MPs say today both that Boris Johnson is safe as Prime Minister and that this whole sorry saga will help cost them power in the election whenever it comes, which, when you think about it, is a rather strange proposition. As I said before, the biggest problem for Boris Johnson in the short term is whether he can or cannot be proved to have lied to Parliament. In the first week of June, a committee, the Privileges Committee, will start to look at that. There are Tory MPs in the majority, but having looked at them in some detail, I can tell you tonight they are likely to be pretty tough. After that, some will have some, but there will be some by-elections, and then one day it's over to you, to all of you, in a general election. Now, we're all busy. We've all got quite short attention spans. But still, my friends, don't forget what didn't happen today. But why today? Why this week of all weeks? 
an enormous U-turn on the windfall tax and a whopping package of help for British families. But if you want to feel cynical about the timing in this little country of ours, by all means, go ahead. Fill your boots. You're welcome. Rishi Sunak's package of financial help certainly came at the perfect moment to help Boris Johnson out of his equally enormous hole. But in the wider analysis, I'd suggest you the help for Johnson B matters much less than the help for the millions of ordinary folk struggling to pay their fuel and food bills. Make no mistake, it may have come late. But when Sunak acted, he threw the kitchen sink at the problem. In fact, not just the sink, but the fridge, freezer, the hob and a cutlery drawer as well. This was a huge £15 billion plus intervention, bigger than anything the Labour opposition was proposing. Indeed, about twice as generous, the Treasury suggests tonight. In politics, as in life... Everything comes at a cost. And for many Tory MPs who only last week had been ordered to vote against a dangerous Labour windfall tax, being asked today to celebrate a virtuous, useful Tory windfall tax stuck rather in the throat. Richard Drax, the South Dorset MP, accused the Chancellor of throwing red meat to socialists. But millions of people, including 8 million on benefits as well as pensioners and the disabled, are going to get real, meaningful help at an anxious time. Commentators who mocked the spring statement for being stingy, and I was one of them, and have been pleading with the Treasury to go further, and I was one of them, should be wary now of never taking yes for an answer. Today, I'm going to start by analysing what Rishi Sunak actually said with Paul Johnson of the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Later, we'll go into the fascinating politics of it all. But first, here is the Chancellor performing his all-important U-turn on a windfall tax for the energy companies. We will introduce a temporary targeted energy profits levy, but we have built into the new levy, but we have built into the new levy, but we have built into the new levy a new investment allowance. Yes, you're right. He didn't actually use the phrase windfall tax, did he? He argues his version is better for investment. But that is what it is, a windfall tax. If someone tells you to build a house and you refuse to build the house and then you do build the house, but with a patio extension and a dormer window, well, it's still a house. So, my friends, is this the end for Boris Johnson? Will Tory MPs tonight in a committee room not far from where I'm sitting finally do in giant haystacks? All day I have been selflessly working for you, which in my case means sitting around drinking coffee, talking to conservatives and hacks in seething, bubbling groups of overexcited plotters and hearing about 400 different guesses as to the result. But you are busy, folk. You don't have time for that nonsense. And as of right now, absolutely nobody knows what's going to happen. Hang around if you possibly can for what is going to be an extraordinary evening and join me later with Ian Dale, where we will give you the result. Now, I've covered every Tory leadership fight since Margaret Thatcher, and Ian knows more about the Tory party than any other broadcaster in Britain, and so together, I promise, we will give you a ringside seat. But meanwhile, there are some things I can tell you. Win or lose, no Tory leader in recent times has fought a leadership contest and survived for long. In 1990, her party forced Margaret Thatcher out. Five years later, John Major saw off a challenge but was thrashed in the 1997 election. Six years after that, Ian Duncan Smith was out when he lost a confidence vote. Theresa May won her vote of MPs in 2018 but staggered on for just a few months before having to resign. And so if history is any judge, and maybe it isn't, then Boris Johnson is toast. The only thing we have no idea about is precisely when the smoke will billow from the toaster. It could be tonight. It might be in a few months' time. It might be at the next general election. But looking at the polls and listening to the boos and talking to Tory MPs, I think the country has turned against him in an irreversible way. Sure, nobody knows who might take over, yet the Tories might tear themselves apart for weeks or months and many will agonise that tonight they have a choice. Stick with disgrace today or vote for chaos tomorrow. But before we get on with tonight's show, I'm determined to talk about something else. The weekend's jubilee celebrations. The booing of Boris Johnson at St Paul's was a heck of a moment, as if the wind in the country had changed. But more than that, I thought the wonderful concert and the parade that followed carried a message about the nature of modern Britain. 
in all of its wonkiness and its battiness, from the marmalade sandwiches and the bicycling eccentrics to the wild environmental optimism, the palace organisers were telling us that we are a fundamentally tolerant, law-abiding, cheerful, very diverse and good-natured people, a people who don't want to be divided against ourselves and who don't greatly enjoy being taken for fools. Tonight, the Conservative Party, as I say, has a choice. If only Paddington Bear was standing. Last night, when I heard the news of the Tory vote and Boris Johnson surviving by 211 to 148, I felt a wave of depression. And since then, I've been asking myself, why? After all, he's only going to face one crisis after another. And that's good for journalism. We love trouble. And the wilder the trouble, the better for trade. But I'm also, I hope, a patriotic person. And this outcome is terrible for the country. Johnson's still there, but he's very badly wounded. Who'd have chosen to the end of all this plotting to end up with the same Prime Minister as before, only more damaged and less able to lead? After all the unifying and edifying celebration of the Platinum Jubilee, all of us somehow on the same side, Britain was quickly brought back to reality during yesterday's vicious parliamentary mud fight. And what was all that for? More drift and division, a wounded government, more months of political mayhem in the middle of an economic crisis. Well, that was worth it. But giant haystacks, as is his right, took a win for a win, and today he promised tax cuts. We will have the scope by delivering tax cuts, I think, uh, to deliver considerable uh, growth in employment and, and, uh, and, economic, uh, and economic progress. Of course, it was only a few weeks ago he was raising taxes after Rishi Sunak's decision to swipe the Labour policy of a windfall tax. But OK, which taxes will he now cut? And given the state of public finances, which spending is he now going to cut to pay for them? Answers, I guess, for another day. Well, another thing he could do if he wants to heal the wounds in the Tory party is to reach out to some of his senior critics to be generous. A little earlier on, I was speaking to David Liddington, Deputy Prime Minister under Theresa May, and here's what he said. I'd have thought the current Prime Minister should be speaking to Theresa May, to David Cameron, to people like William Hague, George Osborne, who held senior office in Conservative governments, and seek their advice. Well, that's not quite the Johnson style we've become used to. But again, who knows? Maybe he has been shaken by the strength of the hostility to him, both among the public and inside the Conservative Party. Maybe he can change. His Tory critics don't think so, and they haven't given up. Today, they're already talking about changing the rules to allow another challenge to him in the autumn. I'd really like to be talking about something else now. I think the country has turned against the Prime Minister and I think his time is up. I'd like to see him go quickly and with dignity. My friends, I don't think it's going to happen and therefore this goes on. Well, it's good for journalism. Lots of twists, turns and moments of drama to come. But one thing I've learned after 40 years in this trade is that in general, what is good for journalism is bad for almost everyone else.